Good morning. <laughs> How are y'all this morning? Good? Good? Yeah? <clears throat> well, other than getting over a cold, I'm doing just fine. So if I, like, drop out suddenly and I start coughing, it's because my throat's itching. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started with worship this morning. Let's stand up and sing Joy to the World. Good morning. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but it is impossible for you to just sing the words joy to the world and have a sourpuss look on your face. So everybody's got to <laughs> smile this morning. That, see, there's a reason we lead with that one. Now, I know what you're thinking. You heard Hunter up here, and you thought we were fixing to break into Johnny Cash. That's all right. Hey, did you know that Trey's kin to Johnny Cash? Oh, did you see his face? He got excited. No. Well, it is good to have everybody here this morning. I uh, hope you had a, a good weekend, and uh, better than that, I hope you've had a good morning being here with us so far. Uh, we've got a good time playing. Uh, we're going to have a good time in worship today. And so uh, you can look around you and see that Christmas is upon us. And so real quick, before we jump into any other announcements, I just want to give a big thank you and shout out to all those of you who came and put in. I'm not even going to ask how many hours it took. I know it was several. Uh, but to get all the Christmas decorations, one, pulled out of the trailer, two, carried in here, and then in the process of putting them up, and it doesn't look like they just got thrown together. Y'all, it looks amazing. So thank y'all very much for uh, all the hard work. All right, just a few announcements, and then uh, we are going to jump right back into worship this morning. Uh, evening service tonight. This is a, a first Sunday, and so uh, we meet in homes on the first Sunday of the month. Uh, tonight we're going to be at AJ and Talisa's house, and uh, everybody always asks, well, what do I need to bring? Talisa's made it really easy on you. Uh, if you have not looked already, there is a sign-up sheet out here on the bulletin board uh, so that you can kind of handpick and see what you want to bring so that we have all of our bases covered there are still a few spots left, so if you want to go out there and check that out, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, now, that being said, don't feel like if you don't sign up for something, you can't come. That, that, that's not the case at all. We would much rather you just go ahead and come on. But uh, if you are in the habit of bringing something, uh, check the list out and see what we got left, and then uh, we'll go from there this evening. But that'll be at 5 o'clock at their house tonight. If you don't know where that is, you need the address. Uh, see me, see them before service is over, and uh, we can get you that address. Uh, deacons, uh, just to remind you real quickly, we need to have a very quick deacons meeting at the end of service this morning. We've got a couple things that we need to take care of before the end of the year. And so uh, if you can just give us a few minutes, we need to have a quick meeting. 
All right, uh, the last thing, uh, it is Lottie Moon time. Uh, last week we said that during the month of December, we're going to start collecting our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, Lottie Moon was a, a missionary, and she made such an impact that they decided to name this Christmas offering after her. Uh, Miss Lottie Moon uh, had a heart to see people come to know Jesus. And so that is what we fund when we take up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is uh, to fund mission work that goes on around the world. And so uh, if you want to give to that, uh, you can find offering envelopes scattered around. You can put it in the Lottie Moon envelope. You can put it in a regular env envelope and just mark it. Or you can just write on your check somewhere, Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and we'll make sure it gets there. Uh, our goal this year is $1,000, and we have made it really easy for you to figure out where we stand in that goal. Uh, there's a wreath just outside these double doors, and for every $100 that we collect, there will be a red bird that goes up on the wreath. So if you can do quick math and count by hundreds, you'll know where we stand from week to week. So uh, anyway, that starts today. So if you are in the habit of giving to Lottie Moon or you just say, you know what, that sounds like a really good thing, then today is uh, the day that we start that. But uh, each week we're going to uh, watch a, a short video about some of the impact that Lottie Moon Christmas Offering makes. And so we're going to watch the first one now, and then as soon as it's over, ushers, we'll go ahead and take our offering. I never dreamed to go to another city. <laughs> I never dreamed to go to another country. I never dreamed to learn to talk another language, but God made possible. When I was 11 years old, my family was very poor. I used to work in the street selling, selling things. One day my dad took my money because he was alcoholic. He had three more families. So I made my own prayer, I said to God, you want to be my father, I need you here. I need you here. Uh, I had a trouble in my teens because uh, of my family and I ran away from home. And uh, we had a program with the IMB missionary friend in the court, Tele Amigo. So I went to that place because I had trouble on myself. I want to kill myself. And they really gave me all the support and prayer for me. I met a missionary called Barbara Rivers. She was putting some pictures and video of the five American missionaries where they were killed in Ecuador by the Indians in the jungle. When I saw the pictures and the face of the missionaries, I started crying. And I said to Lord, I do nothing, I'm only going to church. And these people came far away from their own country and died because of love of our people. So and they said to the Lord, here I am, I want to be a missionary. Missionaries like Barbara Rivers, I was a model, a very real model. I learned how to go places where there's nothing and start something. So I realized not only in Ecuador I need to be safe, but everywhere. So I became pray for India. I was the first Latino to go. I went for 12 years. One thing God told me to preach the gospel, not to be locked in my house. If I want to be locked in my house, I stay in my country. I came back from India. The IMB missionary received me, Guy Mills and Linda, and a friend from Guatemala. He told me, the Lord take you back to Latin America to not be just one Julieta, sino hundreds of Julietas. Send Latinos to the nations. And after that, it started an impact mundial. We do mobilization, training, and sending missionaries to the nations. I believe we are global Christians. Jesus told us to go to the nations, to preach to everyone and everywhere and every time. My dream is to see every church be mobilized to become a missionary church. It's my dream.
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Thank you, worship team, for that. Now, uh, I told you, you can look around and Christmas is upon us. But for some of us, Christmas has been in the works for a while now. Uh, this is something we've been preparing for, uh, and, and I'm no different, not just because I've been listening to Christmas music forever and ever. Uh, you can see up there on the screen, uh, the, the title for our new sermon series is That's Christmas to Me. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was just working around the house, and I, I put my earplugs in and was listening to Christmas music, and a song came on. It's called That's Christmas to Me, and it just kind of sparked this thought, and so I, I put on Facebook, and I said, hey, share with me some of the things that uh, is Christmas to you. When you think about Christmas, this is what comes to mind, and out of that, we started getting a, a picture of some of the things that people like me, like you, started thinking about when it came to Christmas. And so this morning, we're going to talk about one of those that overwhelmingly came to our mind, and that is family. And so I'm just going to give you an alert here, because some of you are going to get nervous with what I'm about to say. I've asked AJ, and that's not what you're going to get nervous about. I've asked AJ to come answer a few questions this morning, but here's where you'll get nervous. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to ask some of you questions and you'll get to be the one to come up here and grab a microphone and be on the hot seat as I ask you different questions about different things but as we talk about family this morning I've asked AJ to come and I, I, I gave him the questions in advance don't know if he's prepared a script I told him said hey keep it under 25 minutes but uh, anyway AJ if you'll come up here uh, we got some questions if we start talking about family at Christmas time and I just want to know quick show of hands while AJ heads up here how many of you really look forward to Christmas how many of you are part of the group that go it can't leave fast enough okay see see I'm proud of y'all some of you I'm like I didn't know if you would be gutsy enough to raise your hand because you thought they were going to throw snowballs or whatever at you and I'm going to tell you we live in Arkansas there is no such thing no but anyway uh, AJ we're about the same age so we, we've experienced our share of Christmases by now we're not going to say just how many that is but we've experienced a few. He's on red. <laughs> we'll find one that works. Ready? Oh, oh wow. we got him. And before we get started, when he said he gave me these questions in advance notice, it was like 9.30 last night when I was going to bed. So That's all right. Just, you, just to let you know. You sleep on them. Okay. But we, we've been around a few Christmases now, and so it's not like this is a new experience to us. But I want you, uh, if you would, just when you think back on the Christmases of your life, how big of a role does family play in your Christmases? I mean, it's plays a big role. I mean, I wouldn't have Christmas without family. I mean, I remember Christmas time at, at, at Mamaw's and every other year going to Virginia to, to go see Granny. So, I mean, it's, yeah, Christmas is family. And for a lot of us, that's the case, isn't it? We can't say one without thinking of the other. 
Um, and it goes the other way. You can't think of family without thinking of Christmas. And so I think a lot of us are going to share AJ's sentiments that it's everything. They're, they're inextricably intertwined. We cannot begin to separate them. Now, this is where the questions get interesting. AJ, do you and your family have any, we'll just say, fun Christmas traditions? I mean, when I think back Christmas and Christmas traditions, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is the day after Thanksgiving, hear me out, the day after Thanksgiving, we decorate for Christmas. We have, back when I was a kid, you know, our Arkansas's rivalry game was LSU. And so we would have the, you know, the game on and we'd be decorating our Christmas tree. That's, you know, one of the traditions that came to mind. And I always think about the, um, the candlelight service um, on Christmas Eve at um, First Baptist when I was growing up there. I just remember that. Also remember uh, Christmas Eve opening one, begging mom and dad to open up one gift Christmas Eve, and then, you know, the rest of them, Santa Claus brought, you know, Christmas morning. And kiddos, do y'all do that too? Do you start begging early? Just one. But then it becomes just one a day or one a week. And by the time Christmas gets here, you're like, where'd my presents go? Yeah, so, yeah, so those are fun traditions. And the thing about traditions is it gives us something to look forward to every year, doesn't it? Uh, some of you, as we started talking about this and we were answering that question, you immediately had traditions pop up in your head that you and your family do. Now, if your family's like my family, there's some of those traditions you probably don't need to say on a live stream for God and everybody to hear. But, uh, yeah, we all have traditions that we look forward to, and uh, they play a big part of our Christmas. All right, now that I want you to think about a time, maybe a, a Christmas that, in your mind at least, where everything seemed perfect. One particular one doesn't really stand out in my mind. I mean, Christmas is, you know, the birth of Jesus, and I mean that's perfect in and of itself. I mean, I, I can. I mean, I think back when I was a kid, and you know, you know, trying to stay up and, you know see Santa Claus come bring the gifts or, and, you know, ended up falling asleep. And, you know, and I think about, you know, some of the gifts that I got, you know, I remember the original Nintendo and the little TV and, you know, staying up all Christmas day, you know, playing Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. But they, they all seem kind of perfect to me, but I, I, I think back to when my Drew and my kids were, were babies, were, were young, when they had that wonder about them for Christmas. They're, they're old now and, you know, they just want stuff. <laughs> and a lot of you can relate. Uh, now, I'm just going to throw out a disclaimer here. Are any of our Christmases ever truly perfect? No, they're, they're not. But as we think back on there's some of them that we think are more perfect than others. We remember very fondly. But then there's a flip side of that, isn't there? There's some of those same Christmases that we think of fondly that were absolute disasters. So, A.J., can you think of one that maybe was far from perfect, but it was an absolute disaster as far as going according to plan, but you still remember it fondly? Not really, no. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't remember a disaster during Christmas time. I mean, I know that's not, probably not the answer you were oh, looking for. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Because <laughs> some people are here going, ooh, call on me, call on me. No, we're not doing open mic night. Uh, but what that tells us is none of, at least AJ didn't have a five alarm family emergency at Christmas time. Well, I, I do kind of, kind of remember one, um, just seeing Uncle Bruce reminded me. Um, <laughs> oh, great. Well, no, it, he, he was the, he saved that Christmas because um, my cousin Stacy, if y'all rem if, if y'all know Stacy, y'all, y'all know Stacy. She's, I mean, I love her to death, but. When she was younger, yeah, she's going to see this, and I love you, cuz. But we, we, we picked names. Everybody had a name, you know, for Christmas at, at, at the Huffman's. And um, we, we were unwrapping presents and whatnot, and Stacy didn't have a present. We, she, was, she was upset. And... She, I, yeah, four, five, six, somewhere around there, and 
leave it to Uncle Bruce to, to go save the day. He, he, he made the trip to Walmart. That's back when, you know, it wasn't on Christmas, but, you know, he, Walmart was open, and he, he went and saved the day. So. Well, that's good. And some of you can, you can remember the same similar situations where they weren't perfect, but somehow the imperfection made it even more special, like a memory of you saving the day. And so a lot of our Christmases, they're, they're not perfect. They're never going to be perfect, but we're going to remember them fondly anyway. So AJ, I got one more question for you. And I, I don't know, again, we've experienced a, a number of Christmases by now. But if you could pick one Christmas memory to relive right now, what would it be? Uh, probably when Drew was four, maybe. We had, um, you know, I, you know, had just recently gotten divorced, and we were. It was just him and I, and he got an email with a video from Santa Claus. And so I opened it up, opened up my laptop, let him hit play. And when Santa Claus said, Drew, and you just, his eyes lit up. And I, I'll never forget that I actually took a video of him watching that. And just that, that sense of awe and that sense of wonder and that sense of innocence, I, I would relive that right now if I could. And again, a lot of you have memories right now that if we said, hey, you had a chance to relive that moment right now, It'd be hard for you to pick one, wouldn't it? Because you have so many. Um, but I, what I want you to see is as we enter into the Christmas season, especially as we start talking about family, don't forget the memories. Don't forget those things. Because family really does play a huge part of Christmas. So, AJ, thank you for sharing some of your family memories with us. Now, I told you... Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with my family that you know, I don't feel comfortable sharing up here. There's some tra long-standing traditions uh, when we all get together that uh, they're fond memories. They make me laugh. And this past week, we got to go in uh, for a funeral. And I was telling Miss Paula before church, it's kind of strange. Uh, last week, I get the news literally 15 minutes before church starts that my uncle had passed away. And the message was on joy. This week we got to bury my uncle, and this had been planned out already, and the message is on family. And so here we are. But one of the things that came about of being with family this week as we shared stories and we reminisced was all the laughter and all the fun that we had of just being together as a family. And so when I tell you that family is a big part of my family's Christmas that is a vast understatement. And for a lot of you, you are exactly in the same boat. You can't think of Christmas without thinking of family. And you can't think of family without thinking of Christmas. They just go hand in hand. But I know that's not all of us, is it? It's going to be the same for a lot of us, but not all of us. And so it's been my experience that there are two kinds of family at Christmas. On the one hand, you have that perfect Norman Rockwell family. If we got that, oh, look how precious that is. I mean, just look at it. Everybody is just dressed immaculately. I, I love, even the dog has a bow on, y'all. This is Norman Rockwell at his finest. The young man in the front, by the way, if any of y'all want to wear the ear flap hats on Christmas Day, I want to see it and I want to get a picture. But he is just so excited Mom and dad are thrilled. They're all bringing gifts to grandma's house. There's the Norman Rockwell family. Some of you go, well, that's what we like for others to think we are. But then there's another side of this. And on the other end of that spectrum, you have maybe the Griswold family. <laughs> I want you to notice all that's going on at the Griswold family Christmas. As much as they want to think they are the Norman Rockwell family, there ain't nothing Gone right that night. In-laws are fighting with in-laws. Husband and wife are squabbling. Kids can't stand to be in the same room with each other. The dog is going nuts. Unexpected cousin Eddie shows up. And by the way, I'm just going to say it up front. Don't be pointing fingers at your cousin Eddie. I don't care what their name is. That's just not nice. It doesn't promote the Christmas spirit. But nothing went 
right. And some of you go, that is more of what our family Christmas is like. And here's what I want to say to you. Regardless of which end of the spectrum you find yourself on, if you are that Norman Rockwell family where everything is just pristine and perfect, or if you are the Griswold family where it just seems like everything is in tatters and shambles all the time, regardless of which one you are, family is an important part of the holidays. It is. And when we look at Christmas in the Bible, you know what we see? Family is an important part of Christmas from the very beginning. And so I want you to think about something for a second. We know that at Christmas time we celebrate God sending his son. You know, we, we see it on t-shirts, bumper stickers. Jesus is what? Jesus is the reason for the season. Some of you are like, I was going to wear that shirt today. I'm kind of glad I didn't. No, we see it, we hear it all the time, and we know it's true. And spoiler alert, we're going to end up there by Christmas Day. But we see at Christmas that God sent his son, Jesus, so that he could one day go to a, a cruel, cruel cross and die for you and I. But have you ever thought of why God decided to do it this way? I mean, he could have sent Jesus any way he wanted. He could have just said, son, it's time for you to go, and boom, Jesus is here in full armor, fully grown, and he's going to march into Jerusalem as a conquering hero. God could have done that. He could have said, son, it's time for you to go, but I don't want this to get all ugly and, you know, war break out. So, son, I'm going to send you down as a skilled politician. I'm going to give you just the gift to, to use your words well, and you're just going to convince the people that this is the right way to go. He could have. He could have said, son, it's time for you to go, and I'm going to send you down there, and you're going to be a gifted prophet that's just going to expound on the scriptures, and people aren't going to be able to argue with it. He could have. But instead, what did God choose? He chose to send Jesus as an infant, and he placed him inside the family structure. The same family structure that if you look way back to the beginning of the Bible, God instituted then. That family structure that God says, Adam, Eve, here's what I want for you. Here's what I'm building for you. Here's where you are going to find all that you need inside the family. So why did God choose the family? Why did that become so much of an integral part of the Christmas story from the very beginning? What did it provide to Adam and Eve that it provided in the Christmas story as well? What does it continue to provide for us? This morning, that's what we're going to look at. As we talk about, that's Christmas to me. And we remember what is worth remembering at Christmas time. This morning, I want us to think about family. What is it that made family so important? So if you got your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 this morning. But it's not the part that you may expect. We're going to be in Luke 1, but we're going to pick up in verse 39. And by the time we get to verse 39, there's been a lot of stuff happen. The angel has already appeared to Mary and has delivered the shocking news that Mary, you are going to have a baby. Which for a young woman is an exciting thing. Except for one small detail. She's engaged, but she's not yet married. She's not yet been with her husband. And so she goes, oh, that's great. But I got a question, Mr. Angel. How? How is this even possible? And so the angel explains to her that you are going to be pregnant with the Son of God. Mary, you have been chosen. You have been handpicked to be the mother of God. And to Mary's credit, she was a little bit overwhelmed, but she accepted the assignment gratefully, with enthusiasm. But we also know that not everyone shared her enthusiasm. And so what we're going to pick up is, where does Mary turn? What does Mary do well, not everybody is ex as excited about the assignment as she is. And so in Luke chapter 1, we see her going to visit a relative that is going to be huge for Mary. So Luke 1, verse 39, it says this. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea 
where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the, be the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of, his humble, of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Now we said that by the time we get to this passage, Mary has already gotten some surreal, life-changing news. Mary, you are going to become pregnant. You are going to have the Son of God. Now, ladies, when you discovered that you were pregnant, who, outside of your husband, who was the first person you told? You start calling family, don't you? Maybe it's a, a brother or a sister or your mom. And because you're excited about it. Can you imagine being Mary? Hey, mom, I got some news I need to tell you. I know you're not going to believe this, but I'm pregnant and it's God's son. Can you imagine how her parents were going to react to that? It was scandalous. No, we had such plans for you. Mary, you're betrothed. We just found you the perfect husband. Mary's parents were shocked and probably embarrassed. What about this perfect husband that they found for her? We know him to be a man named Joseph. And if you look in Matthew, you get Joseph's side of the story. And it says when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, what did he want? I love her, and I don't want anything bad to happen to her, because that was very much in play. According to the law, Mary, as an unwed mother, should have been stoned to death. Joseph said, no, 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 I, I don't want to do that, and I'm the one that would press charges, and I'm the one that could make that happen, but I love her. I don't want that to happen, but I just don't know that I can go through with this. And so he makes up his mind to put her away quietly and divorce her. And just to move on and go their separate ways. Can you imagine how that feels for Mary? The loneliness. What do I do now? But you see, as part of the angel's announcement to Mary, what else did he tell her? I mean, it's not just you that's pregnant. Your kinsman, your cousin, your aunt, whatever she is, that word is kind of generic, Elizabeth, the one that they thought was barren, the one they said was well past childbearing years, she, Elizabeth, is going to have a child. And in Mary's mind, it clicked. I know where I need to go. I know who's going to understand me. I know who's going to believe me. I know who's going to know what I'm going through. It's Elizabeth. And in the passage we read, Mary reaches out to her kinswoman, Elizabeth. And she goes, and we know that they're familiar because what happens? She just walks on in. How many of y'all still knock when you go to family's houses? Oh, heck no. 
Now, I did when Nana got older is because there was a good chance that Nana was going to be asleep on the couch. And if I walked in, she was going to lose herself or spit her teeth out at me. I don't know. So I still knocked on the back door. But most of us, you, you just, maybe it's a courtesy knock just, and then on in you go. Notice what Mary did. It says she gets to Zechariah's house, and just in she goes. So we know that they are close. They're comfortable. This is someone that she's familiar with. And with the news of the angel fresh on her mind, she goes to see Elizabeth because she knows that she's the one person who could truly understand her situation. And it's in this family connection that Mary found the things that she so desperately needed at that time. And folks, as we dive in here, as we look at this a little closer, I want us to see some of the things that family provided for Mary, but guess what? They provide for you and I as well. As we look at Christmas this year and as we start thinking about family, these are the things that family ought to provide for us. This structure of the family that God ordained way back when. These are the things they ought to give to us. So what are they? One of the first things I want you to see here is that it gave Mary a sense of community. Now when we start talking about community, and it's a word that we've tossed around here some, what do we mean? What are we talking about? It's not simply a gathering. Some of you, your gatherings at Christmas are huge. I mean, like, you've got to start doing the logistics and the math to figure out, is everybody going to have a chair to sit in? How many kids are going to have to sit on the floor? It's not just a gathering, though. Community is this act of sharing life together. I told you I've been listening to Christmas music for a while now. The other day, a, a classic came on the radio, and you'll know it immediately. But one of the lines is, I'll be home for Christmas, and then what comes next? If only in my dreams. And as you listen to that song, it, I don't know about you, it stirs up some feelings in me. On one hand, I long to be with family. But then on the other hand, you're going, but what if it doesn't happen? Well, my thoughts are still going to be there. As I relive the memories and the traditions, my thoughts are still going to be there. And so when we sing songs like, I'll be home for Christmas, what is it that we're longing for? We're remembering fondly the, the togetherness and the fellowship that we have with those closest to us. Those moments where we can just be together. We can let our guards down and not be afraid to be ourselves and be judged for it. I'm going to tell you, as a preacher, that is one of my safe places. It's when I get to go home. Because see, here, I'm Brother David. When I go home, I'm just Bubba. Yeah, that's right, you heard me. Natalie asked me the other day, she goes, Dad, why doesn't Papa ever call you David? I said, well, he does when he's referring to me to someone else. I said, but if he's talking to me, it's always either Bub or Bubba. When I go home, I'm just Bubba. And there's a safe place there where I just get to relax and decompress and just be me. You guys can relate to that because you have that safe place. Whether you're Bubba or not, you get in family this place where you just get to be yourself. And you don't have to worry about what are they going to think of me? Are they going to judge me for saying this or doing that? You just get to be you. When Mary decides to go to Elizabeth, the comfort of that relationship meant Mary trusted Elizabeth implicitly. She could just be herself. She could be completely honest. She could lay out the whole experience and not wonder that Elizabeth was going to judge her for it. She found someone that she could confide in. See, at a time when Mary would have been ostracized at home, what was Elizabeth's response? She welcomed her with open arms, and she was excited for her and glad for her. I love the line in there. Elizabeth, six months pregnant with John the Baptist, says, When she heard Mary's voice, 
John leaked in her womb. And Mary, or Elizabeth, starts testifying about how blessed Mary is. And I can imagine in that moment, Mary just smiling because she knew she'd made the right decision. She was exactly where she needed to be. She was where somebody was going to share life with her and not point a finger at her. At a time when Mary would have been ostracized, Elizabeth welcomed her with open arms. And folks, hear me. When family is functioning properly, it's a safe place to find community. You tell me if any of these sound familiar. When family is functioning properly, triumphs are shared and celebrated. It's not jealousy rears its ugly head or why do they get that when I don't have this. No, when family is functioning properly, properly, triumphs are shared and celebrated. Or maybe it's this. When family is functioning properly, problems cease to be yours but become ours. Family circles the wagons and goes, we're going to figure out a way through this. We're going to figure out what we need to do together. You're not alone. When family is functioning properly, we find that kind of community. As we look through this passage, we see that Mary was very grateful to find that kind of community with Elizabeth. She was grateful that Elizabeth provided her that safe space, that outlet. Folks, this morning, I just want to ask you a question before we get any farther into this. Are you grateful for the community that family provides for you? Or is it something that we've become so accustomed to that we just take it for granted? Having buried a family member in just the last few hours, don't take family for granted. You're not promised tomorrow. Mary appreciated it. She was grateful for all that Elizabeth was providing for her. And folks, we ought to be grateful as well when we think about the community that our family provides for us. But it wasn't just community that Elizabeth gave to Mary. Elizabeth also provided encouragement for Mary. When we talk about encouragement, sometimes I think we sell it short. We think maybe it's just a pat on the back, hey, good job, proud of you, which that is encouragement. But encouragement is so much more than that. Encouragement is giving someone the confidence to pursue the right thing. Hey, keep going. Don't quit. Keep going down this right path. Encouragement is giving them the confidence to do just that. I've been very blessed in my life. I've got a lot of encouragers in my family. Now, if you ask my family, they would probably tell you something like this. We wish Bubba was closer to home. We wish Bubba were here more often. We wish he was a part of this or a part of that. But in the same breath, my family would look at you and say, but. We're glad he's following God's will for his life. Folks, and that's why they are encouragers to me. You see, I have people who believe in me and they push me to do whatever it is that God has called me to do. And if your family is functioning properly, guess what? You've got them too. You've got people who are pushing you to do the right thing. You've got people pushing you to do whatever it is that God has called you to do. It's one of my favorite things about my family. And when I think about Christmas and what it means to me, I can't think about that without thinking of them. Mary's situation was completely unheard of. And I'm sure it was hard on those around her to handle. I mean, seriously, parents, what if you'd got the news? What if your daughter came to you and said, Hey, I'm pregnant, but um, don't worry, it's God's son. Oh, yeah, sure it is. Yeah, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. I know how this works. And you're worried. You're disappointed. Her situation was unheard of, and it was difficult to handle. But I want you to notice Elizabeth. Elizabeth saw God's fingerprints all over this plan. And what did she do? 
she encouraged Mary to follow that plan with confidence. Mary, don't let anybody look down on you. Mary, don't let anybody make you doubt God's plan for your life. Mary, don't let anybody try to dis to dissuade you from following what God has called you to do. And I think it's safe to say that it took. Because after she meets Elizabeth, Mary breaks out into this song. And what is she saying? I am blessed. God, why did you choose me? Why did you remember me? I'm just so grateful that you did. Mary celebrated what God had done in her because Elizabeth celebrated what God was doing in her. Elizabeth actively celebrated the plan and encouraged Mary to follow it out with confidence. Mary, there's going to be days when people are going to say things. Mary, there are going to be days when you're going to walk in and everybody has been snickering and all of a sudden it gets really quiet. And you know they're talking about you, Mary. But don't you worry about it. You follow this plan that God's called you to with confidence. It tells us that Mary spent three months with Elizabeth. Which means that she probably stayed through the time that John the Baptist was born. And then she decided she needed to go back home. But at three months, Mary is starting to show that this isn't a rumor. She's pregnant. But I have to believe that the lessons that she learned through Elizabeth, through family, during that three months, when she walked back in to town, and she heard all the snickers. She saw all the fingers pointing. She heard the laughter and the jokes and the rude comments. And she said, no, I'm still confident in the plan that God called me to. I want you to think this morning. Who do you have in your life? Who do you have in your life that encourages you to do the right thing, even when the right thing is the hard thing? Mary was grateful that she had Elizabeth to encourage her to do the right thing, even though the right thing was the hardest thing she would ever do in her life. Who do you have? Elizabeth gave Mary community. Elizabeth encouraged Mary. But there's one more thing we want to talk about this morning. That was that Elizabeth gave Mary support. When we talk about support, there's a lot of different ways we could define that. But you could say this. Mary knew that Elizabeth had her back. Mary knew that Elizabeth was in her corner, regardless of where it went, regardless of what else happened, regardless of what anybody else said, Elizabeth was there. In Mary's situation, she needed someone who would stand up for her, someone she could count on to encourage and comfort her. And in that three-month period where everybody else was sorting things out, Elizabeth stepped into that role. In that time where everybody else was trying to figure out, is, is this really God's plan, is it not? Elizabeth knew from the beginning. And she displayed a trust and approval and a, a, an excitement about Mary's news. And every time they talked, Mary knew that Elizabeth was right there with her. She was in her corner. She was backing her up. And she kept pushing her forward. Folks, we all need someone in our corner. We do. I don't care how independent or how tough you think you are. We all long for it. We do. And it's okay to admit that. We want somebody that's going to stand with us. We want to not always have to be the one that's standing alone. Elizabeth was that person for Mary. So again, this morning, I want you to think about Who's in your corner? Who is it that's standing up for you that you know that when things get hairy, they're going to be right there? They're, if it's just you and them against the world, well, then it's going to at least be you and them. It's not ever going to be just you. Who's in your corner? Let me ask it a different way. Whose corner are you in? Who are you providing support for? Who is it that 
you can give that assurance that you're going to be there. When we look at the Christmas story, we see just how big family is and has always been. Now, some of you, when I talk about family, you just light up. When I talk about family, your smiles get wider, your eyes get brighter. You can't wait to get a hold of me as soon as we get done so you can tell me about your family. I'll listen to every word you got to say, but you got to listen to mine too. When I talk about family, some of you, you just absolutely get giddy because you can't imagine life without them. But for others, when I mention family, you get this sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. When you think about family, they're, they're really a part of your story that you just soon not bring up. When you think about family, they're, they're just a part of things that are going on that you just wish wasn't there. And so when we get to this time of the year around the holidays, and especially Christmas, it's hard for you because you feel like you missed out. Can I tell you that today, whichever end of that spectrum you fall on, whether you're the Norman Rockwell family or the Griswold family or something even farther down the spectrum than that, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, I want you to know that family can and should still be a big part of your Christmas season. And it can be. See, as we look at Scripture, especially as we look at the Christmas story, it's easy to see why we say that the church ought to operate like a family. It's easy to see why we say that as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, we are family. There's a reason we call each other brother and sister. Folks, we got to realize that Christmas doesn't, or family doesn't just have to mean blood. We are family. We get to be this for each other. So today, I don't care whether, again, you say, oh, my family is great, they're just wonderful, and, you know, I couldn't ask for more. Or if you say, I just really... <laughs> not rather talk about that right now. Family can still be a part of your Christmas because we are family. And we are to be there for each other in the same way that Elizabeth was there for Mary. So this morning, I want to close. I'm going to just issue a, a two-fold challenge. First part's this. I challenge you to celebrate Christmas by celebrating the God-ordained structure a family. I think sometimes we get guilted into thinking that if we make Christmas about family, we've shortchanged the cross. And folks, that's not the case at all. God ordained the family structure. And so this Christmas, I want you to celebrate it to the fullest. Celebrate the structure that God gave us. Enjoy it with a grateful heart. But I also challenge you to this. Remember that family goes farther than just blood. I challenge you to be family to those around you this Christmas season. I want us to get in the habit of being community. I want us to get in the habit of being encouragers and support for everybody that we see around us this morning. Because that's what we're called to. It's what we see displayed in Scripture even here in the Christmas story. So when we talk about what's Christmas mean to you, it's okay to say family. It's okay to celebrate that. It's okay to live it out for all those around us. Let's pray. Father, this morning, uh, I just want to stop and I want to say thank you. Lord, thank you for my family. For those that are blood, and those that are blood bought. God, thank you for all that they have done for me through the years. And Lord, I thank you that the outlet that you've given me to be family to others. 
Lord, I pray this morning as we think about what it is that Christmas means to us. Lord, as we look back at that original Christmas, Lord, we see that even then, from the very beginning, God, family was part of your plan. God, I pray that we would appreciate family, and I pray that we would live out its plan and its structure to the fullest for those around us. God, speak to us now as we go into this time of response. Lord, just have your will and your way in this. We love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and worship. Folks, if you're a child of God, you know what that means? You got a family. You got family. And guess what? We're not perfect. And if we're all honest, we're probably all going to be farther on that Griswold side than we are the Rockwell side. We're not perfect, but we're here for you. My challenge to us as we go into this Christmas season, yes, enjoy family. But let's be family as well. All right, was there anything before we're dismissed this morning? Don't forget this evening, 5 o'clock. Um, like I said, you can check the sign-up sheet. There's still a few spots left. Um, if you don't, look, if you're like us, if you walked into our house right now and opened up the fridge, it's sad. I mean sad. Um, but if you're in our boat, just come on. Um, we would love to have you any way we can get you. So, but yeah, tonight, 5 o'clock, like I said, if you don't have that address, see me, see them, and we can get it to you. Yes, ma'am.
Lottie Moon offer ugh, Lottie Moon envelopes are outside. Um, we ha- we're leaving offering plate out there, so there's some out there that you can grab on your way out. All right, anything else this morning? All right, well, uh, we'll go ahead and be dismissed. Uh, David Kelly, will you dismiss us this morning?